in the Bible, in the Old Testament, I told you that the most important thing to know in the Old Testament, to understand about the Old Testament, is that it all points to Jesus. Well, there's more than one way of pointing to Jesus. There's a prophecy. That's a verbal way. We point to Jesus with our words. The first prophecy about Jesus in the Bible is Genesis 3.15. We talked about it when we studied Genesis 3. Genesis 3.15 is called by the older scholars the Protevangelium, the first gospel. It takes the form of a curse upon the serpent, where God prophesies to the serpent that one day there will be born of the seed of the woman one who will crush the head of the serpent and one who will have his heel bruised by the serpent. That's the Protoevangelium. That's, that's a prophecy, a verbal forecast or foreshadowing, Genesis 3.15. Well, there's another way to point to Jesus. You can also point to Jesus by the characteristics of something. For instance, the sacrificial lamb points to Jesus. The lamb is innocent, but the lamb is slain because of sin. Well, that's a picture of Jesus. It's not a prophecy. It's not verbal. It's pictorial. It's a picture. It's an animal, something that happens to the animal. The ark was a picture of Jesus. What does the ark do? The ark saves us. The ark saves us from the wrath of God. Once we're within the ark, we're safe. We don't die in the flood. That's a picture of Jesus. We go into the ark and we're safe and we don't die in the flood. But there are also people who are pictures of Jesus. Joshua is a picture of Jesus. They have the same name. Joshua's name in Hebrew was Yeshua. Jesus' name in Hebrew was Yeshua. It means God is the Lord is my salvation. What does Joshua do? He takes him into the promised land. What's Jesus going to do? He's going to take us into the promised land. What does Joshua do? He does something for them that Moses couldn't do. Jesus does something for us that Moses couldn't do for us. Well, I just want to tell you that Joseph is also a picture of Jesus. As a matter of fact, Joseph may be the most thorough and complete picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, there's an American Bible teacher who wrote a book about this, and in the book he claims that there are 50 ways, five zero ways, in which Joseph is like Jesus. Well, 50 may be stretching it, and maybe he saw some things that aren't really there. But the fact is, there are many, many, many ways that Joseph is like Jesus. And so deep in the Old Testament, in the first book of the Bible, we have a dramatic indication that the whole thing is pointing to the future, pointing to the birth and the ministry of God's own Son, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've already had an instance of it, haven't we? He is loved by his father, and he's actually loved more than his brothers. Jacob, of all people, should have known how dangerous it was and how mischievous it was for a father to favor one son over another. That led to great mischief and many problems in Jacob's life because Isaac actually favored Esau over Jacob. Jacob was a victim of this parental favoritism, a father loving one son more than another. And because he was a victim of it and because he knew how much strife it led to and the problems that were produced by a, a parent loving one child more than another child, he should have been careful, but he wasn't careful. He flaunted his love for Joseph above the others by favoring them. 
But the fact is, Jesus of Nazareth was the one Jew born who could claim to be not one son among many, but who could claim to be the only begotten of the Father, the beloved of the Father. And so in that way, even though in some ways jo Jacob's favoritism for Joseph was problematic, mischievous, not wise, but wrong, the fact that God the Father, Father did favor Jesus was a good thing and a positive thing. And in that way, Joseph does point to Christ. But obviously there's something else here. Because Joseph accepted assignment to go and ensure the safety of his brothers. But in going on an errand to ensure the salvation of his brothers, they plotted to kill him. Now that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Why was Jesus born? He was born for the salvation of his brothers. He was born for the salvation of Israel, and not only of Israel, but for the whole world. So what do his brothers do when he comes offering a plan of safety for them, offering a plan of salvation for, for them. They kill him. Now there's something else here. There's something that happens. Joseph goes down in the, the pit, into the pit, presuming, presumably to die, but he comes out of the pit alive. It's a picture of resurrection, isn't it? Now, the picture's not complete, it's not perfect, because Joseph does not actually die, and Jesus did actually die. And Jesus is not taken out of the pit before he dies by the ones who wanted him dead. But Joseph was taken out of the pit before he died by those who wanted him dead. So no analogy, we call these pictures types. No type of Christ in the Old Testament is absolutely complete and absolutely perfect. They're all partial. But the partial truth that we see is striking. And it teaches us something. It teaches us that God is doing something. It teaches us something that God is anticipating something. It teaches us that God knows all these things that are going to happen in Jesus' life. And He sends, the, he sends us hints and pointers and prophecies and patterns and types long before Jesus is ever born. And the fact is, Joseph goes down into the pit of, of death, but he comes out of it alive. It's a pattern, isn't it, of resurrection. And so Joseph is taken um, into Egypt. Reuben comes back. Evidently, he's away with the flock while they're selling their little brother. He comes back and he sees that Joseph is gone. It's too late. His plan would not work. I'll mention something at this point. Um, I tell you that Joseph is like Christ. The main way that Joseph is like Christ is that Joseph will become a redeemer. What does a redeemer does? He's someone who buys someone else out of trouble at cost to himself. This is what Christ does. He buys us out of trouble. He pays a purchase price for our sin at great cost to himself. It cost him his own blood. It cost him his own life. And yet he was willing to pay the price. Joseph is going to become a redeemer but he will pay a great price for it. He will pay a great price for suffering. I'll tell you this now, but I'll repeat it more than once before we're finished with the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph. The whole point of the Christian life is to become like Christ. And Christ, it says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, is perfectly like God. You remember when we studied Genesis 3, you remember the lie that the tempter told. The tempter said to Eve, the reason that God doesn't want you to eat the fruit is because He doesn't want you to be like Himself. That was not only a lie, that was the opposite of the truth. The whole point is for God to make us like Himself. 
And the way he makes us like him, he made us like himself in creation by making us in the imago dei, making us in the image of God. The way he makes us like himself after we become sinners is through redemption and by making us like Christ. If we are to become like Christ, our Redeemer, then we ourselves will do redemptive work. We will live redemptive lives. If we do live redemptive lives, it means that we will suffer. The degree to which you can be used redemptively in someone else's life, that is the degree in which you can rescue them from the consequences of sin, and help bring them to a place of safety, which is what a Redeemer does. The degree to which you can be used in their life, redemp lives redemptively is directly proportional to your willingness to suffer for them. And you have to remember that Christ suffered for those who hated Him. God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. In other words, while we were still in a position, in the position of God's enemies, Christ died for us. Paul goes on in Romans 5 to say, it's not such a big deal to suffer for your friends. It's not such a big deal to suffer for your family. It's not such a big deal to suffer for those who love you. But Christ suffered for those who hated him. So does Joseph. Joseph will come out at the end of this story as the Redeemer, the one who redeems his brothers, not only from, from death by saving them from starvation, but from sin by changing their character. Jacob was not able to change their character with, by preaching and by religious ritual in, in Genesis 35, but Joseph will change their character but he will not change their character without his own suffering. We're about to see how he's going to do that as we study the rest of his story. Um, Reuben returns in verse 29 and he sees that Joseph is not there. So he says, the boy is not there. Where am I to go? What am I supposed to do now? What are we going to tell our father? Verse 30 said, They took Joseph's clothes, and they killed a goat, and they dipped the tunic in blood. Now today, we do all these forensic tests, and we have all these television shows in America about detectives who investigate murders. And they analyze the blood, and they can tell you all kinds of things about the blood. They can study the DNA, and they can find out exactly who the murderer was. In those days, you couldn't even tell the difference between a goat's blood and a man's blood. So they put a goat's blood on Joseph's coat, and their plan is to tell our father that this is Joseph's blood, and that Joseph was obviously torn up and, and eaten, torn up and consumed by a, a wild animal. So they go to their father, verse 32, they say, We found this. Please examine it and see whether it is your son's tunic or not. They don't say, Our brother's clothes. They say, Your son. Not our brother, but your son. They hate him. In verse 33, it says, Jacob examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. It is my son's clothes. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Verse 34, Jacob tore his clothes, he put sackcloth on, and he mourned for his son many days. I don't know if he did that for Rachel, but he did it for Joseph. So now he has lost his favorite wife and his favorite son after God has promised great, great things for his life. By the way, I can't prove this, and I don't know if he realized it the first day, but Jacob is very, very wise. He's very smart. He's very cunning. And it's hard to lie. It's hard for, it's hard for 10 people to lie. 
Your face changes when you lie. Your voice changes when you lie. Your eyes change when you lie. And I have a feeling that Jacob knew that they were lying. I can't prove it. I think he believed that Joseph was dead, but I'm not sure he believed their story about the way Joseph died. And he says in verse 35, I will go down to death, I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. Here's what he meant by that. He meant, I will never get over this. I will never stop mourning and suffering for the death of Joseph until the day I die. My life will never be happy again. I will never forget this. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Queen Victoria lived until 1901. Her husband died in the 1860s, I think about 1861, maybe a little bit later. She lived for about 50 years as a widow. It was said that she never smiled again. That's probably not true. It probably is true that she never smiled in public. She never smiled again after he died, Prince Albert, her husband, whom she loved so much. <clears throat> what Jacob is saying is, I can never laugh again. I can never be happy again because Joseph is dead. If someone you love dies and that person is a believer, they're not dead. They're alive in another country. They're alive in a country you can't see. They're alive in a country you've never been to. That was the case with Jacob. Jacob was sorrowing. He thought his son was dead, but his son wasn't dead. His son was alive. His son was alive in another country, a country he couldn't see, a country he'd never been to. And there will be a reunion. And if the person you care about who's died was a believer, you will see him again. You will see her again. There will be a reunion because they're not dead. They're alive. They're alive in another country. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, he was sold to a man named Potiphar. Verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Now, immediately when Joseph gets to Egypt, he gets to know someone who knows the ruler, an officer of the king, the Pharaoh, an officer whose name was Potiphar. 